wise people, that's what we're talking about today. I'm Jason Flom, the powerful and attractive man to my right is Peter Tijan. Um, yeah, we're talking about Animal Eyes and all things 1984 and that whole era because it was very, very special for us. Um, and we're going to show some things as well. This is going to be like a special episode, don't you think? To it's me, it's a special episode because Animal Eyes was out when I got into them. And um, some of the stuff that I kind of want to show, uh, like this guy here, this might have been the first rock magazine I bought. Wow. I mean, I started, I had... Um, you weren't buying the 16 magazines? No, I wasn't into that. I mean, I had a, a few albums, but I didn't really, really get obsessed with music until Kiss Hit Me in 84. Um, and here, this is February 85. So, I don't I don't know if I had any magazines in late 84, or if I really started buying them in 85. But this is an early one for me, and it's this era. And for me, the whole look and everything they had going on is worth... We're talking about yeah we were just talking about before uh, the camera was rolling about how badass that photo is on the back of man of yeah. that that is just cool right there i yeah. know i know it's touched up a bit with the fire and stuff photos are still touched up i mean like crazy i mean you yeah, know i mean exactly that's what you do with photos mm -hmm. people have been doing that since forever i mean um this is supposed to look like a badass heavy metal band you know Kind and, of a, a, a and you know what? Or something. It is a badass. Animal and it band is, at this it point. is. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, we read Mark St. John saying some stuff about how the fire wasn't there, this wasn't here, and they took an arm from another take and put it on <laughs> <laughs> stuff like that. You hear that stuff, mm -hmm. but that's what it takes to make ordinary people into looking like, you know, like heavy metal. Just aren't ordinary. Rock gods <laughs> like this. They're ordinary. They're superheroes. They're ordinary. No, by this point, they were people. Ordinary. But, yeah, you know, to really make. Yeah. To make like a like a, a rock god or whatever, you yeah. know, like I mean, yeah, it's you know, it's all part of it. You know what I mean? I mean, the I Dynasty mean, album cover. I mean, yeah. it's, everything's touched up. You know? Yeah, we've met um, you know rock stars or whatever, and they, there's a certain point when you meet one, you can, you kind of just think he just kind of looks like a regular dude right now. You know what I mean? Because he's start, not all of a sudden all touched up. And, <clears throat> once you start talking to him, yeah. you're just people. Yeah, you know? exactly. That's why I've never really been. Starstruck, and I, I always thought like, if I met Phil Collins, you know, or who would I on the drummer, you know, who who would it be that really like where, where I wouldn't really even know what to say? And I gotta say, the most starstruck I ever was because, like, when Animize came out, I was uh, ten or just had, had just turned eleven. I was pretty young. I couldn't really go to the show. Asylum came around, you know. Um, once again, I'm 12, I'm 13. I couldn't go to the show. I didn't have any friends who drove. I, it, it wasn't even a possibility. I heard, well, they're coming to the Tacoma Dome. I read the review in the newspaper, but I couldn't go. So it wasn't for years later. And by the time I was going to shows, um, I wasn't really into what was going on with Kiss as much at the time. It was hot in the shade. And, and I don't know why I didn't go to Revenge. Did they come here to yes. Revenge? Yes. I didn't go. Maybe it was just way out of my radar. Not many people went. <laughs> I mean, I was totally in Justice for All and stuff like that at that point, you know. Yeah. So I was mm -hmm. playing the thrash bands and stuff like that. So it was but, probably but just Trickster out of opened. Mind. Oh, I, oh, I don't know why they missed that. Yeah. Why did I miss that? Yeah. <clears throat> so anyway, so the reunion years for me personally, when Ace and Peter came back, I just was like, I can't watch them play like this because the original quartet when they were together in the 70s was just so powerful. I was like, no, I can't. I can't see the reunion stuff. You know, the manager that they got rid of that wanted to keep the revenge lineup going. Mm -hmm. So they like, well, you're out of here. We'll go get Dr. Larry, Larry, you know, we're gonna Larry get Mazur. Yeah. yeah. I kind of felt what he felt. Like, this revenge and Carnival of Soul shit, this is awesome. Don't stop this because this is real. You know, revisiting the past with the reunion it, it just wasn't as special to me. I, I did eventually come around and um, get some of the merch and things like that. But the first time I actually saw them were my stories eventually. <laughs> Sonic Boom yeah. Tour. Yeah. And before, when the, that curtain was up there, <clears throat> and I heard that keyboard, dong, you know. And <clears throat> that's when I realized that Paul and Jean are in the same building somewhere <laughs> that I'm in. Yeah. I seriously. I remember And I just family. felt like, holy shit, Paul and Jean that I grew up on. Yeah. They're in this building back there somewhere. I couldn't believe it. It's yeah. just, you know. And I had that same feeling. Uh, actually, the first time I seen Kiss was on this tour. 
Um, but it was... Uh, Animalize was your first? Yeah, it was 1985 That's at cool. the arena. Mm -hmm. uh, not the key arena, but the arena that was next to the Coliseum. Hell, you know, maybe held <coughs> 9,000 or something. Mm -hmm. It was smaller. Uh, so that was the first time I seen Kiss. So this album, very special. He got into Kiss around this time. And I was in my Kiss Prime. You were finally right got to see him. Finally so got what was that, him. winter? What, what, what was that? They came here February 13th, 1985. So the tour went till March, I think? Late March, I believe. So you saw the kind of like the end of the yeah. tour. So they're all primed. Oh, Most yeah. of the songs from the album were lost out of the set list. My well, here's the set list right here on the back. <laughs> That's the that, that was pretty yeah, much Yeah, it was saw. pretty much exactly the same as this Animal yeah. Life and Sensor. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, they, were no, they weren't doing I've Had Enough or anything. Mm -hmm. oh. They were doing like uh, five or six songs. I think I think from the album when they like on the first show. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then the, after the then, first show, they dropped some right. Exactly. Start dropping them. They did burn, bitch, burn. Dropping like flies. That's yeah. awesome. Um, yeah, <laughs> Twe Queens Reich on the Warning Tour opened. Mm -hmm. It was like big mm -hmm. coming show. Yeah. So I remember there was an interview with Jeff Tate of Queens Reich in the mm -hmm. Tacoma News Tribune because he was a hometown boy playing his homecoming show, and he was talking about the tour with Kiss, and he was. It's the first time I think I ever heard anybody refer to Gene as a businessman. Yeah. He said, like, yeah, they're great on tour. Gene's like a businessman. Yeah. Like, I remember thinking, Gene, a businessman? Uh, it's Gene Simmons. <laughs> but, yeah, I was totally into Queens Reich at the time, too, so that was a good opening band. Um, really? You were already into the EP and the Oh, morning? yeah, yeah. Big yeah. Because do you remember the Henry J. Rock show on, nope. on local cable? Nope. Okay, well, they used to play um, Rainbow in the Dark video, mm -hmm. um, Power in the Glory by Saxon, things like that, mm -hmm. Run to the Hills. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they used to play Queen of the Reich video. The Queen of the Reich. Yeah. yeah, it's so like a little like Raiders of Lost Ark <laughs> kind of, every band did their Raiders of Lost yeah. Ark kind of video. Kiss did, did with uh, All Hells Breaking Loose. That's their, uh, yeah. yeah. But yeah, so Animalize, um, Let's backtrack a little bit, as we always do, because mm -hmm. we have to set the scene. Yeah. Kiss took off their makeup in 83, lick it up. Anyway, ended up firing their guitar player, Vinnie Vincent. Uh, they got this new cat named Mark St. John, who was uh, kind of a hotshot guitar player at the time. Um, and go into the studio in New York right after the lick it up tour. Actually, separate studios. You want to explain that? It's kind of interesting. I'm guessing the drums were all done in the same room. I don't really know for sure how much information is really on the details of the recording, but we know at some point Gene and Paul are in different studios and Mark's going back and forth. They probably have engineers and they're trying to do a deadline, they're trying to get them done. Also, Gene's working on his songs and we know that a lot of times Gene will play guitar on his songs. <coughs> and um, Paul will on his and Paul will play bass. Um, on this one, Paul had um, Gene, what's his name? Oh, Jean Ubar. Mm -hmm. Hope I'm pronouncing that right. Playing some bass and stuff. Yeah. Um, um, from the, uh, they met him on tour, actually. Uh, Plasmatics opened up for Kiss. Uh, Jean was their bass player. So, yeah. So, he plays bass on uh, Get All You Can Take, Under the Gun, and Thrills in the Night, and he co wrote Thrills in the Night. That's cool. Yeah. So, so uh, yeah, Gene had to uh, exit early from the recording se sessions because he was filming Runaway up in Vancouver, actually, with uh, Tom Selleck. You know, we, we've seen it. We know. What do you think of Runaway? <laughs> I mean, at the time, I'd rent it from Movies to Go or whatever, and uh, I mean, I loved it. I thought it was a fun movie. It's and a very Christy fun Alley's movie. in it. It's a fun, yeah. It's I a mean, very fun movie. if I went the other way, I'd probably say Tom Selleck's in it, but Christy <laughs> Alley for me. <laughs> Here's Christy Alley for me, man, and Gene's in it, and he was good and evil. I thought it was awesome, you know, mm -hmm. the little mechanical creatures. Uh, and Richard Marks' his wife is in it, too. Oh, really? Cynthia Rhodes. Oh, that's his wife? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's mm -hmm. right. She was a hottie, too. Um, but, yeah, I liked it. I liked his first movie. I was probably the best thing he was in, maybe, you know. What well, you about unless, you count, unless you count Trick or Treat, which is brief. Oh, in. Trick or Treat is... Yeah. I love Trick or Treat. I have a Trick or Treat poster yeah. downstairs. I watch. I watch it all the time. I, yeah. lo I love that movie. That's a fun movie, man. Mm -hmm. Skippy. Yeah. Other than that, Skippy's I movie. liked. I liked One in Dead or Alive as well. That was decent. It was movie. pretty good. I, I yeah. guess I just pre kind of preferred yeah. uh, Runaway. I liked his character in Runaway. <coughs> Charles yeah. Luther. Yeah. <laughs> totally. He, he's got some good scenes in that movie. Yeah. Yeah. Remember when he goes into the 
he's actually in the police station and he has the eyeball for the identification on the computer. Oh, really? I don't remember. He holds it up. And, yeah. He has a cop's eyeball, but yeah. It's, oh, yeah. that's cool. I'm going to have to watch it again. It's been, it's been years now. But um, yeah, so there's there's talk where Marcy Johnson and Paul and Jean are, are fighting so bad that they're in different studios. But it was, it's deadlines and why not be in two separate studios and getting guitars put down over here and blah, blah, blah. So, um, you know, Mark says a lot about Gene and Paul's relationship not being too good at the time. Um, maybe he caught him on bad days here and there. Maybe Paul was already getting pissed off that Gene was going into movies. Um, one thing that I feel, and I'm going to say right off the bat, I feel like people read this. I feel, I feel like people hear this on podcasts or read this uh, in one of the Kiss books, and you hear them retort this almost word for word. Yeah, Gene's songs are phoned in, you know, it's like this total Paul terms, you know. And, uh, Gene's songs on this album are badass. Absolutely. Yes. I mean, the difference between the two. This album is pretty big. For Paul, it's pretty big on the self-help. <laughs> yeah. Get all you Get can all take, you, you know, you're under the gun, you're backs against the wall, you know, <laughs> you can do it, kid. Uh, you got to rise up, you know. Uh -huh. uh, you know, and he's singing to the youth at the time, he mm -hmm. was not an idiot, of course. They're badass tunes, but different ways of writing the lyrics and things I get from the Gene songs got these slinky little riffs with a lot of space in them sometimes. Mm -hmm. Gene's riffs are kind of bluesy, and a lot of times they're almost comical. But da 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 uh, modulations that are happening going in and out of solos. Mm -hmm. um, Gene songs are absolutely great on this album. I get so tired of seeing Gene songs bashed. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> Peter, the same, they're always in the same terms, too. Like, they all read the same thing, you know. I texted Peter today. It was because I was listening to, uh, let's just say, some other animalized album reviews. Uh -huh. And people are just bashing on Gene songs. And Gene in general at the time. And I was, I was pissed. I was like, oh, come on. Texted him about how yeah. pissed I was. Um, I just don't get it. Gene, yeah. okay, so he left the recording early. Paul took over and did a great job. And maybe Gene didn't play bass on all the songs, but you know what? He doesn't play bass on all the songs on Dynasty mm -hmm. you know, and a few other albums. Yeah, um, they never really, I mean, the first three albums are pretty, pretty staunch. They're oh, on yeah, their instruments. Yeah, yeah um, for a while. But eventually they realized that they wrote a song, why not just put it down their way and capture it the way that they think it should be. And um, uh, I do that stuff with my own group too, you know what I mean? Um, sometimes, so there's nothing really wrong with it. When you listen to the album, you're thinking like, <clears throat> yeah, that's a badass bass lick, way to go, Gene. And then you're like, oh, that's some guy from the Plasmatics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, well, that, that doesn't, Gene. It does occur to you once in a while. Yeah. But yeah, that's not Gene, that's Jean. It's the sum of the whole. Yeah. It's the, you know, it, 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 it didn't matter to them, you know, and they're put, they want to get a. So they're Steely Dan in it. Tr they are saying. kind of Steely Dan <laughs> in it, but they want to get a certain uh, quality across. And I've always been really proud of Kiss for always getting that quality across. I think they're an album band. I don't think they have the one hit uh, on every album like some other bands that I might like a lot, but I got those one or two songs really uh, do it for me. For me, uh, Paul and Gene's voices, very particular voices, you know, um, high quality. Two very, very strong singers um, and both of them great songwriters. Um, and they're there to kind of quality check each other too, you know. Oh, by far. Yeah. And and then when he, they got Eric too, I mean, it's just it's always been powerhouse. It's always been really quality songs, you know. Definitely, without a doubt. Without a and doubt. this album has got um, an energy right off the bat. Each song on side one and side two start with just high energy Paul songs. There's flirtations with double bass. It's never just like did you get chicken? Did you get you know? But there's you know what I mean? There's little bits of double bass in there. Uh, Eric Carr, I'm guessing Eric Carr probably would have loved to play more double bass because he was kind of thrasher. I, I oh, know, yeah, you know. yeah, I've heard that. He was a huge Metallica fan. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. But uh, a powerhouse album. The energy really never stops. The slowest song is Thrills in the Night. 
not exactly a ballad, you know. It's kind of like, it's a sort of down-tempo, uh, moody rock tune. True, you know? true. Uh, there's not a whole lot of two and four on the snare and stuff like that. They're using the cymbal and the toms really on the chorus. Kind of interesting, there's barely any snare on the song, I noticed. Yeah. But, but other than that, the pace of the album is what I'm getting at. Mm -hmm. This album is a rocker, man. This album is... Such a rocker. Yeah. I do have a complaint that there's only nine songs. They did yeah. that on Dynasty too. Yeah. I mean, you yeah. couldn't come up with that tenth song. <laughs> I mean, think well, about Rock and Roll Over, Love mm -hmm. Gun, Hotter Than Hell, all those albums. Ten songs. That's just what you expect mm -hmm. from Kiss. Nine? Come on. Well, and it's not like there's that eight-minute song, you yeah. know, that makes it like, you know, longer. No, they're just yeah. all like four-minute songs. Yeah. So come on. Give Sometimes. You know, oh, you know what, though? Gene was too busy giving songs to Keel at this point. <laughs> no, he was. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, I would have liked one more Gene song. That would have been good. For me, yeah. though, the, the, the energy, the pace, the recording of the album, um, the recording of the album is kind of different from, you know, Creatures has got thicker drums, um, and it, it's recorded by different people, but it's also just mixed by different people. You can't mess with Bob Clear Mountain. You know what I mean? That guy, all the albums that guy did, I mean, they sound amazing. And he had a lot to work with, with like Eric's drum sounds and his performances and the care that they took in Creatures of the Night, you know, uh, they really, really wanted to do a good job on there. And they knew that it started with the drums. And here, the bands back up where they, kind of where they want to be. Um, they're not the cover of People Magazine level anymore, but they're on the top of the heap with the other rock the other rock and roll bands. You know? mm -hmm. They're on yeah. the cover of Circus Magazine every other month or whatever. So, yeah. yeah, so they're doing it up. And I feel like this is just an album in that streak of great albums. You know, yeah. Creatures, Look It Up. And this was so. probably the most popular of them all <clears throat> as well because of Heaven's on Fire. If it's the most popular and if it went platinum and if it went gold way before Look It Up went gold and all this stuff, why are people still like finding? Why do they I, I wanting to it. bash it? I don't get it. Yeah, it's like there's. I wouldn't call this a controversial Kiss album, uh -huh. but it's not like known as one of their best. I would say without makeup, I think this it is. is one of their best. <laughs> yeah. I saw a review and some guy said, you know, he put he's like didn't like the Gene songs. I feel like that's a cool thing to say, you know, because you hear the Gene is making movies at the time. Um, and he goes, yeah, eggs in one basket, but she threw me a bone. He's like, well, I just turned it off. And I was like, oh, my God. First of all, I'm like, that's a great line. That's called badass. You know, yeah, Gene's lyrics are somewhat comical and uh, ironic. Gene likes irony. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just, I don't get it. I love it. You know, I love it. You know, right. Paul's songs are straight ahead, great rock stuff. At the time, I kind of preferred the Gene stuff. Over the years... Uh, the Paul stuff has grown on me, so it's it's equal now for me. I mean, I get it, you know. But at the time, even as a 12-year-old kid, I was like, this self-help stuff is a little cheesy, actually. <laughs> I bought that. It's funny you say that. But I, I loved it. I was listening today to the album, driving yeah. around, and I remember thinking, wow, Paul. I was like, <laughs> you're really yeah. sticking up for the youth of America. Yeah, here. yeah. I mean, he's, he's trying to reach the youth of America. Yeah. And he was, yeah, so. But they were on this streak with these albums and animalized as far as the recording um, Paul was more commercially minded without it. Absolutely, absolutely. Gene was more like, "What would you have I'm if you didn't have Paul with the Look It Up song put together with Vinny and yeah. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. The Heavens on Fire and Forever Later and all that. If you didn't have that hit, what would you do? Exactly. You know? Yeah. And as they found out in the '80s, could we even book a tour if we didn't have the hit single? It was hard. True, true. On the tour, on the level they wanted to do a tour on. Yeah, like the Forever single um, kind of saved that tour. Yeah. Yeah, we're getting into like hot in the shade. That we'll get into that later. <laughs> but um, but anyway, yeah. it's, it's a special album for me because it was the album at the time. But I had many years of where I thought it was a jazz knob and all sorts of stuff, and got into this and this and this. Where I've had multiple breaks from Kiss and come back around and reinvestigated and reacquainted with all the albums and put on Asylum for the first time in say like seven years or eight Whoa. years. You know what I mean? And it was like. Ooh, yeah. God, listen to those Tom sounds, you know what I mean? Yeah. And like, this rocks, you know what I mean? Yeah. And when I put on Animalize, I remember thinking, wow, those reverbs are bright. You know, it's a different sounding uh, album than, it's the, even brighter than Licked It Up. It's a brighter album. The toms are almost thinner. Um, 
you know, around this time, 83, 84, you hear a lot of people, you know, you go out of one board, you go into a channel on another board, so you have another set of EQ, like synchronicity. I heard there's a lot of double busing happening. Um, and Tom Petty, Damn the Torpedoes, is famous for that. that, that producer for that album, wanted things bright and clear and consistent. So it's just the direction things are going in the 80s. I think that the, this recording keeps up with stuff around that time under lock and key and but it still holds up you know, like some albums from that balls. era do not hold up sound wise i mean you listen to balls balls to the wall which is why yeah. lars and james said dude you're going to come with us because you're going to mix master of puppets balls to the wall except sounds amazing and it came out like a year before this mm -hmm. it's the symbols perfectly beautiful just crisp you know you can just it's got all that pretty top it's got the low it's got the punchy drums it's very similar to a recording like this. This is the way things were going. So you weren't, you weren't really going to get another Creatures of the Night. Looking back, we all love those Tom sounds on Creatures of the Night. You know, um, It's a little bit more earthy. These verbs are brighter. I can tell that the drums, are, uh, the toms are EQ brighter. And I don't know if he's like just liking his small toms, but they sound a little smaller, maybe because there isn't as much low and mid lows EQ yeah. on in his toms and stuff like that, but good example. Listen to the begin the open drum intro to get all you can take. That's not a huge drum sound. Yeah, it's just -dum, like -dum, -dum, -dum. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It almost sounds like it's from Unmasked or something. I mean, people were experimenting with having you know five toms over here and six yeah. more all the way around here, and then you turn around and you got a synth synthesizer kit, <laughs> or you got your yeah. Simmons kit back there. But it was a lot of toms. So when I play a four piece kit, it's just chunkomatic the whole time because I'm just. I'm just Tommy Lee it up, you know what I mean? Because yeah. those are your choices, and your so so with a kit the size of Eric's in this era here, you know, you know, like you got you got these small toms, you want to utilize them. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it all these things go into making the album what it is. Um, I do think the verbs are a bit bright, a bit a bit sheeny. Have you noticed that? You know. Um, I, I personally, I don't have any complaints about the way the album sounds. If you listen to... My only complaint is there's nine songs. Thrills in the Night. It's got that snare thing at the start. It's that, so, Well, that's the thing I don't listen to. It's so right. <laughs> you know, and then yeah, the rest I, of the song is barely any snare drum. And the chorus... Dun, dun, dun. Did you notice that? It's ride bell mm -hmm. and like floor tom. Change, a large change tom. Change it enough for the chorus. Dun, dun, yeah. dun, dun. And it's, it's creating this mood and stuff. But Big chorus. You know, but at the start of the song, you can hear that snare, and it's so the verbs and stuff are so bright on it. Mm -hmm. But I have to say, bright verbs and stuff. Um, I work on that with my albums too. I want them just bright enough to where they're really coated with this consistency, you know, but not too bright to where it's like it gets piercing or it gets too thin sounding, you know. Mm -hmm. So speaking of drums on this album, Alan Schwarzenberg does drum overdubs. Mm -hmm. What do you think that entailed? Probably those toms on okay. you know, <laughs> did I, did you and me just okay. saying. <laughs> yeah. He came in with some roto toms. Let's let's, let's Paul, get like anything I can do. <laughs> <laughs> we'll put it in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got okay. some octobombs over here, man. Wow. So yeah, that's not a known fact that Alan Schwarzenberg is on this album, but he is. Mm -hmm. I don't know how big of a role he played on it, but lots of people you know. did that. I mean um, You know Eric was like, it's this guy again. You know, Is like, he going to replace me on a song again? <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> I mean, they have got the basic stuff, and then it's just fun to see what different people are going to do, yeah. um, what they can bring to it here and there. Yeah, it's just overdubs. Um, it wasn't like the full track. So anyways, i uh, got some stuff here. Um, this is the new 180 gram. Looks pretty much exactly like the original. You can tell the logo's a little bit different. It is a little here. different. Yeah, it's a little bit different. Um, not totally, but... With these 180 gram reissues, I like the pictures on that side. Yeah, I always there's some more. I, mad I always thought it looked like they were in the snow, right? Some here. more Mad Max, but it's probably right here. This yeah. little rock quarry thing, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, mad Max. Yeah. Just, these are just really great if you just really want the record in really great shape. You know. Otherwise, I mean, I love originals, mm -hmm. but I picked up a bunch of the 180 grams. This here is, I think it's Polystar. Um, Japanese copy here. Just um, Mercury, Mercury label. Okay. It's interesting because it's got the OB over here, you know, as, as an insert, but it's over here on the right. Oh. So that's kind of different, you know, because OBs are usually on the left, unless it's lick it up and then you just put it over their whole unmasked faces. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's got this here. 
Bam. Oh, that's cool. And then bam, that's another cool. copy. Yeah. Do you remember the days of getting an album and just staring at <laughs> that, say that those you know, liner notes and the pictures, just studying them for hours? Yeah, yeah, totally. Trying to yeah. figure out where's this producer go and is yeah, that the exactly. same engineer over here and who's Dave Whitman? And mm -hmm. so, yeah. so, um, Poly Star's got the, uh, you Look know. Look at that. that that's cool. The yeah. Casablanca logo. It's cool to see that with the, and of course, if you just look at the pressing of the Japanese, all the Japanese are just, whether they're scratched or not, they just, they're just so flat and beautifully pressed, you know. They definitely yeah. no quality over there. Yeah. And then I think I have a couple standard, oh, I have a Vertigo, which is uh, in English. Look at that. Here's a weird one, huh? You know, Tom, Tom <laughs> Selleck in Runaway had Vertigo. Remember, I mean, you remember that when he was on the helicopter? Yeah. The I'm, I'm connecting things here. Dude, that's magical the way he did that. Yes. He had vertigo. Yes, he did. In the, in the, in the helicopter in the beginning, he can't look down. <laughs> he had vertigo. And then I have another analyze here, which has got the, the shrink on it. Uh, it's not sealed, but even if it was sealed, I'm just that idiot that likes to crack it anyway to be the first one to ever put, put the record on. And then, of course, the regular... American one is the Mercury, the black label. Yeah. You know. So there's those. Um, then we got some seven issues if you want to, you can reach those. Yeah, for Thrills in the Night, actually. Um, you go ahead and explain. The that. American uh, Thrills in the Night. That, that's American, okay. The American Thrills in the Night has got uh, Burn Bitch Burn as a B-side. and then, um, Word to the wise, turn that around. Flip it around, play the B-side yeah. instead. He's not a fan of Thrills in the Night. No, I'm not. Uh, we'll get, we're going to get to that. Uh, this, what is it, Japanese? Thrills in the Night. I, and it's on Polly Star. That was the Japanese. And game. on the B side is Murder in High Heels. But pull it out and look at it. And Word to the Wise. Flip that thing around. Play pull, Murder in High Heels. Pull it out. Much Don't better. be scared of the size. That's what she said. Uh -huh. um, so look at that. Casablanca. Pretty cool. There go. There's our <laughs> thumbnail right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> All right. Leave it up for a second. Uh, YouTube will detect that. Oh. But what's the B side? The B-side's Murder in High Heels. Oh, yeah. Like so, said, yeah. flip it around. So, that's cool. They uh, bought a different B-side for a different market, I guess. Oh, interesting story. So, Mitch Weissman mm -hmm. co-wrote three songs in this album. Get All You Can Take, While the City Sleeps, and Murder in High Heels. Mm -hmm. And he was in Beatlemania, of course. Mm -hmm. So, oh, Gene's album so I got all excited because there's a Beatles, a world-famous Beatles tribute coming to uh, Muckleshoot. Yeah. And we're going to go this weekend. So for some reason I had it, I just thought Beatles tribute, Mitch Weissman. I bet he's in that band. And I got all excited, like I'm gonna go there, I'm gonna meet Mitch Weissman. And it's the Nowhere Man? Or, or... It, it's, no, it's, they're called Yesterday and they're, I'm sure they're super good, but Mitch Weissman's not in the band. Well, um, and plus you, he's probably like 80 now, so. Well, can you find somebody cool in that band that could sign this as Mitch Weissman? I will take it and get it signed. <laughs> So um, there's that. It's and like sign it as Paul? No, no, Mitch Weissman. <laughs> yeah, just fake it, man. Yeah. Like, so, I need to put this on eBay. Yeah, Mitch Weissman played um, Paul McCartney and Beatlemania. And Beatlemania was like one of the original tribute bands. Like, you know, they, they were famous <clears throat> in the 70s. And he was also an actor. But he also co-wrote with Kiss. Um, yep. So he also played some guitar in this album. This Indeed. One. Yeah. So what do you have in your hand there, Peter? Well, what I have in my hand here is... <laughs> <laughs> Animalize VHS, and I spent many, many hours watching this. Oh I, my god! I couldn't yes. get enough. I couldn't get enough. Yes, of it. I borrowed it from a friend named Heather, um, which I always thought was a little haughty, a redhead, and I just never really had the nerve to. <laughs> or maybe I was just too young and dumb to say anything. But uh, she was very cool, and she was a Kiss fan. She had it, and, and I still never said, "Do you want to hang out at the roller rink?" You know what I mean? I should have. Do you want to go see ET with me? <laughs> <laughs> do you want to go see E.T. with me? That was a come on line in 1980. I, I never did. You know what I mean? I, I, I don't know if I was really, uh, although totally sexually developed yet, but Heather, okay. man, thanks for letting me borrow your... <laughs> is this the very copy? Did you not get No, it no. I found okay. this somewhere, and this is a nice shape. Her shape, hers was, she watched it a lot, too. She loved it. And hers had a sticker on it still that said something like 59 or 69 bucks. Whoa! Ridiculous. Yeah, no, it was it was very. Expensive. They were expensive, especially specialty uh, concerts and stuff like that back then. Were pretty, pretty pricey. I also have um, uh, it's a blueback uh, CDR. It's the uh, DVD 
Spanish bootleg version with the Carnival, <laughs> Carnival of Souls picture. <laughs> Carnival of Souls picture here. Gotta have it. But hey, when you get a DVD player and you can't do a VHS. I've never really um, compared if this is probably full screen and I watched well, this that's today too and I didn't even think about it. Burned directly from there. Yeah, it probably is. Yep, yep, yep. I think there, I thought there was an official DVD release also, but uh, maybe not. Okay, so Peter, an answer this question for me. That is the KISS logo. Why can't they use it on the side? <laughs> you know what I mean? Look at that logo on the yeah, side, yeah. if you can see that. Because you, you know put it mean? on your shelf, you want it to like stick out. Yeah, yeah. This yep. just says K-I-S-S. -S. Kids like us in 84, we could see that, that KISS logo like, you know, 300 miles away. You know what I mean? We <laughs> yes. could see it like, oh my god. Yes. Is that a new old stock doubt. Peter Chris cassette sitting on that shelf over there? You know what I mean? We can see it. You know? mm -hmm. Another thing I was telling you this that bothered me about this. This is an official Kiss video. Rock and roll features rock and roll and night. N I G H T. Spelled correctly, yeah. but as we Kiss fans know, yeah. wrong as well. It's I, supposed to be in that tank. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that bothered me. Yeah. Um, so yeah, a little bit about this, more about this. This was when you talk about animalize, you have to talk about this. So, that was a huge thing in the era. I think that really helped also the record sales and then, then on top of it, and that went gold. Oh yeah. That went really, that, that sold really all, well. Yeah, all Kiss fans bought this. Yeah. Then um, after I gave Heather's back to her, a few years later, I would go to, uh, where was it, Blockbuster? I would rent it all the time, you know? I would rent it all the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's funny, now you get the VHS on eBay for like, Five bucks or whatever, ten bucks, you know what I mean? Really? It's not that, yeah, it's not that big a yeah. deal, but at the time, that, that sucker was like yeah. expensive. Yeah. So Kiss are out there on their Animalized tour. The album comes out September 13th, 84. They start a tour in England. And all of a sudden, it's not Mark St. John playing with them anymore. Yeah. Mark had apparently got a form of arthritis. And, well, I just noticed the difference in colors right there. Oh. Yeah, there's uh, these animalized LPs he has. They're all kind of... A little different. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, I mean, there's not, not a lot of variances in the 80s stuff as much as there were kind of in the uh, mm -hmm. 70s with the, yeah. with the makeup era. But yeah, the back of the Vertigo one is That's literally got uh, literally orange yeah. uh, text. In yeah, as opposed game. to yellow. Yeah. Um, so anyway, sorry, sorry to sidetrack. Hey, um, orange text, it's worth... Mission. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, they caught my eye. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, they start the tour and um, fans notice that's not Mark St. John up there. And Kerrang actually wrote the story. Kerrang was amazing. Mm -hmm. We could talk <clears throat> a lot. About but the first tour was uh, uh, Europe, right? Yeah. And, yeah. And so Mark... Uh, they even thought he kind of looks like Mark and <laughs> with the same kind of hair, yeah. nobody will know, especially over there. Yeah. They, they, they love that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they did, Kerrang did uh, break the news. And I think at the time, Bruce was just filling in. He wasn't a member of the band. Yeah. But he was doing a great job and got even better, more comfortable with the band. Come late November, they're in the States playing now. Um, and Mark's arthritis condition seems to be better. So they're going to give him a chance. So he does play, like, what was it? Was it two and a half shows? Half one a show. Th he played I, one whole show. So I'm going to say one and a half shows. Um, with the band, and have you seen pictures from him? He, he held the guitar way up there, it was so yeah, awkward. Yeah. It's like, what the, you playing a ukulele? What's going on? <clears throat> um, <laughs> he, he just didn't look right, and I don't know, I heard a bootleg in one of the shows, I think in Big. He didn't really play his solos note for note, that's for sure. Uh -oh. He just kind of just ripped it up and shredded face. Yeah. But anyway, I think at that point, they're just thinking, you know what, this sounded way better with Bruce. Yeah. Bruce is fitting in. I mean, Bruce fit perfect. Yeah. My opinion is that Mark was such a ripper. Like, I've been listening to, with headphones, uh, in detail, the Animalize album. Kind of like I never had before. I just always listen to it like a fan. I'm listening to it lately, like listening to the, the things that, how Mark would play around in scales. And um, I hear people say that, like, oh, he never bent notes. Uh, Bruce is more bluesy. And it's like, no, not really. They're both shredders on kind of the same level. Mark... Um, was kind of innovative with how um, he was closer to Vinny with that energy and stuff. Uh, he did some really interesting things. They come up, uh, he'll do a harmony with something that's uh, he had an energy for sure. You know, he ripped it up. Bruce is perfect for the band in every way. For me, I, in this era, I thought Bruce had a little bit more of uh, Tom, like 
little bit more of a Boston, like a little slinkier sound. He didn't have that venomous attack, mm -hmm. but he was like just a great, perfect player. Yeah. And I know that in rehearsals that Mark St. John was told to kind of simmer down now, <laughs> simmer down now. Don't, you know, like, you know, Take don't, it easy, Norton. Don't jump around too much. And really, Paul and Gene were really trying to establish themselves as basically Kiss with a band, but everyone knows they were kind of side guys, you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so there was a little bit of, uh, there was something going on between Paul and Gene and Mark there. Uh, I read some stuff where it wasn't totally comfortable for Mark because he was, he was told to simmer down a bit. True, and yeah. so I think it was uh, a mutual thing when when uh, they finally decided to bring Bruce on. Like, and, and Bruce just seemed always oh, seems like a great guy and a smart guy, and he knew how to fit in. He knew how to fit into what it was. It was Kiss, but it was Paul and Gene's Kiss, which really it always was. They were always the leaders of the group, you know. Definitely. But they weren't. I mean, on the Animalized video, the show right. is always on for Gene oh, yeah. every second. Oh, yeah. Now that's I think that's why guys always thought Gene was a badass. He's, you know, he's a performer. Yeah. And it's just like, he's playing, and when he's not playing, he's looking, finding a person instantly, and interacting. Usually a and woman. Doing some arrogant thing or whatever yeah, it is, yeah, you yeah, know. Yeah. And it was just badass to watch, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Paul had that energy, though. It was different, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. but, yeah. <laughs> Shane and I used to uh, not make fun of Gene, but point out that Gene, like, sometimes, you wouldn't, he, he, Gene didn't even know what he was pointing at half the time. He'd be playing all of a sudden. <laughs> Like you don't even you just went like yeah, that. You just went like that, and you pointed at this. It's not like you pointed something. at the smoke machine. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you. Like, and it's because he knows how it's going to look on video. Later, exactly. You know? And pictures. Yeah. I was in a Who tribute for a while. Uh, we did three or four shows, and it didn't go that well. I wasn't the best Keith Moon. Musically, I sounded exactly really like Keith Moon. I worked at it. It's kind of a natural rollicking thing that came out, of my, came out of my love for Ringo too. But, um, but appearance-wise, I did not act like. Keith Moon at all. It's just you weren't like this. I wasn't in women's underwear standing yeah, on my stool. Not a horse trank um, I'm not even that good at flipping sticks, mm -hmm. you know. So um, don't but, tell me they like kicked you out of bed. No, it just didn't work out. But the guy told me something right before a show. He says, he says, whatever you do, don't ever look bored for a second. Play for the camera. He says, if no one comes in tonight, it was at the Big Easy and uh, Boise, was, and there's pretty big clubs. And um, he says, I got the camera set up there in the balcony. And he says, whether or not we have 400 people or 40 people play for that camera. And so, how many were there? It was a pretty big night. It was there with a Zeppelin tribute and a Doors tribute. And they were both great tributes that night. Not that I'm a big playing every tribute band I can guy, but I played in a couple. But A Kiss one. Oh, yeah. yeah. We'll talk about that. One. Yeah, but Gene's presence, uh, it's pretty good. And it's always that. You, you look at the uh, footage, uh, the Creatures of the Night, the Brazil stuff. And he's just like, oh. you know, he's just like. Oh, there's a point where he bangs so hard he falls down. <laughs> yeah, no, no, he is into that show. Yeah, he always did. I mean, it. picture there's 180,000 people out there. He's yeah. just, oh man, that had to be a, a total like thrill. He always gave it, and maybe that's why he forgot lyrics more than Paul or whatever. But oh, yeah. he plead, you know, he plead, he put on the show. So <clears throat> yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, anyways, <laughs> we sidetracked, but that's the whole point no of this way. episode. I wouldn't sidetrack. The whole point of this episode, <laughs> Peter told me before the show, he goes, hey, let's forget like any kind of format and just talk about like 1984. And... Our episodes are usually 45 minutes-ish yeah. for mm -hmm. some reason. Cause right I now we're at like 44, I can see. 44, and we're not. We're yeah. still going to talk about this album cover for another hour, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Is yeah. that Eric Sorum they used for Paul? Or... <laughs> <laughs> that's a mannequin. <laughs> so that's Lick It Up. Yeah. Uh, we'll get to lick, lick it up is coming up because I've been thinking about that album a lot. Yeah, that's a great yep. album. Anyway, so um, we were leading up to this. So they kick Mark out of the band. Yep. They bring Bruce in officially. <laughs> now I've heard that the very night this was recorded, which by the way was December eighth, nineteen eighty four. Mm -hmm. I'll mention something about that. That's here. what we're listening to. We're listening to the yeah, broadcast. We're, we're, we're listening to radio broadcasts. Mm -hmm. Um, so this was Bruce's first official show uh, gig as a Kiss member. That's oh, what, that's what I heard when they gave him the keys. Yeah, like thing. this is Bruce. Like mm -hmm. he's like right on. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he is great on here. I thought he fit in perfect. I thought he looks great. This video has got the classic Bruce Kulick, the blue Charvel, mm -hmm. and it's got Paul's Animal, BC Rich, oh, yeah. classic Kiss guitars on this. Oh yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. Um, so. 
again, December 8th, 1984. Mm -hmm. Over in Hollywood on that very same night, like Vince Neil's too busy killing somebody. Oh, yeah, that same night. Yeah. yeah, I hated Vince for that. I loved Hanover. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, historical night in rock and roll. Also, December 8th, 1980, John Lennon. So, yeah, a lot of tragedy, but this came out of it in 1984. So they were played, it was Cobalt Hall, by the way. That should mm -hmm. be mentioned. <coughs> Cobalt Hall, yep. uh, legendary in Kiss circles. Mm -hmm. um, the Cobalt Hall footage from 75. Yeah, Kiss Alive was, some of it was recorded. The surface, recently. Um, yeah. Um, so they played there, it was like nine years later. They took pictures with the guys on the back of Alive. Um, <coughs> so that was cool to see. It. Some magazine printed mm -hmm. that. Uh, so it was a, this was a big night for Kiss. This is their big Detroit return, you know, back as a popular metal band again, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, they had a hit song, Heaven's on Fire. They were riding high. So they recorded this um, December 8th, 1984. Mm -hmm. I remember the date. January 26, 1985, it aired on MTV. Mm. But, edited version. Yeah. Uh, Creatures of the Night wasn't on it. I don't think Under the Gun was. Maybe a couple others weren't on there. I remember seeing it when they showed it again. They showed it periodically on MTV. Oh, yeah. I think they showed it a few times, you know, after that. But I saw it too, but I couldn't remember the song list like you because I'm not a wizard. <laughs> um, so when this did air. A wizard? Yeah, yeah. You're right. You, January 26, 1985, MTV airs an hour version. This is, I think this is up to 90 minutes, I believe. But, the, you know, they edited the, they edited it and put it on. And, of course, there's no cussing or anything, as Paul does on this. Um, and st were you watching it at the time? Were you gathered around the, the tube watching the MTV concert? Well, the first time it aired? Yeah. No, no. I saw okay. it uh, when, they came, when they played it. I think they played it a couple more times, and I, I caught it eventually. But I didn't see it when it right okay. came out. No. Well, here's the thing. So it was like <laughs> three weeks, two or three weeks before mm -hmm. they played Seattle. Mm-hmm. So I taped it, of course, and watched it constantly. Really? You taped it up there? Oh. See, I had just become a fan, maybe even a month or two after that aired, so. Okay. So that's when I, yeah. So, when this, um, finally, when I finally seen them, mm -hmm. it was like watching this happen in front of me. It was the exact same yeah. show. Yeah, that's <laughs> Which, cool. you know, it was cool. Kiss was in the same room as me and everything, but. Did it, they say all, did Paul have all the same, like, yes. he's never seen you a, you know, yes, he's yeah. seen you, Dan, is what he said. Yeah, saying. yeah, the whole love gun thing. Yeah, that's... That. Yeah. Not yeah. only is that not his baby. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was cool, though. That's Don't cool. get me wrong. It was my first rock concert, mm -hmm. and I uh, loved it. But, uh... So then later on, I think... Later on in 85, this came out, like, the whole concert, unedited, uncensored. Excuse me. Of course, it is definitely edited. They redid vocals, probably some solos. Yeah, because we're listening to the unedited yeah. radio broadcast, radio broadcast from that night. <coughs> there's some, there's some differences. I mean, it's good. Oh, it's but if it's really gonna good. go on MTV, if it's gonna yeah. be a VHS, I mean, you know, they perfected it. Yeah, all day. and I guarantee you, a lot of bands did that. A <coughs> lot of bands. So anyway, yeah. So this comes out, and this was big news in the Kiss fan circles right here. This was huge. I remember Circus, I think, advertised <laughs> this and some other magazines so we were aware this was coming out and yeah. it was for the time very pricey yeah but i think a lot of us ended up getting it for christmas and things like that yeah and yeah it was just like you couldn't wait till your parents went to bed so you could go downstairs and put this in the vcr <laughs> yeah, watch yeah, this totally. man or when you got home from school and your parents weren't going to be home for a while and you put this in yeah this was yeah. this I wore this thing out. Yeah, after like, school. And a couple years later, uh, it was this and Exposed, back and forth. Yeah. You know, I loved Exposed. It was really fun. Yeah. Um, you know. And the thing I like about this is there's not a lot of sheen to this video or anything. It's not like you're watching an MTV video. It's a KISS concert. Yeah. It's it, recorded really well. It's filmed professionally and recorded yeah, well. Yeah, Sony did it. But, you know, it's, you know, there's just not a lot of gloss to it. It's just, it's KISS raw live. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, not completely raw, because there's some edited music on mm -hmm. here and touched up things, but but yeah, this is as close as it ever got at the time to having a Kiss, like, Kiss concert in your living room. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, wore this thing out, and then Kiss Exposed came out, but that's for a different podcast. That's and for I, a different episode. Some other things about this, too, since we're talking about this, uh, the Paul guitar solo. 
Does Bruce doesn't really get a solo? I don't think Bruce. No, gets a no, solo. he didn't. So you know, it was it was his first day officially. Absolutely, of the <laughs> yeah, it, it was absolutely becoming a Paul and Gene thing more and more and more. Um, and for me, that's when I stepped in. So I didn't think anything of it. I thought it was awesome because I thought they were awesome. I mean, look, you know, it's a Paul and Gene band. Mm -hmm. The other guys are awesome. You watch Exposed. Bruce is just running down the stairs, edit her out. You know what I mean? That's his, one of his That's, big, big yeah. parts in the video. You know what I mean? I mean, and when I was getting into the band, 84, like, they're still selling the makeup. And it was making people like me go back and find all the records and get all the stuff I could. Oh, yeah, and turn I that remember, thing around. I remember filing a Peter Chris uh, belt buckle, like, solo album. I was like, oh, yeah. But, you know, it was, it was a combination of things happening, you know. It's the Paul and Gene band. But for me... Um, I loved it, you know, yeah, and I mean, who the, are they going to put, you know, Eric in the front of, I mean, it's, you know, yeah, yeah, it's exactly. Paul or Gene usually, yeah. kind of anyway. Uh, talking about the look, I loved the look at the time, you know what I mean? I think the wig and the Wait, little... Gene wore a wig? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> the wig and the little, the little band kind of helped hold it on. By the way, be saying, because of that movie Runaway, he had to cut his hair. Yeah. I thought it looked badass. I thought it looked great. I thought it looked... I thought his, his normal curly hair... I thought, yeah, he looked, he looked very cool. You thought he looked... Look at, you, his, you look at his hair. Hot, weren't you? I was going to say attractive. <laughs> look at his hair hair. That's awesome. Look at that. Look at that. You know, it, it looked cool on him. And as a young dude, I thought, this is... I want this rocker on my wall. I had all these pages on my wall out of these issues. Oh, I hate when they... Is that picture reversed? No, that's not reversed. It looks like it is, though. Yeah. Reverse pictures, scar on the wrong eye. Some of these Can't things are really it. funny in these magazines. You know what I always thought was funny about Hip Parader? Hmm. And by the way, I've since learned that Hip Parader, like, the, like this one says it's by, um, um, I think Andy Setcher was a real guy. But, um, like, Winston Cummings, probably a fake name. They would just oh. write these under... Aliases, um, Winston but the, the, the names of the art, the the in articles in here are funny. Mm -hmm. Like you know, like a, a popular one would be "Kiss Out for Blood." Yeah, yeah. You know, like I bet you, <laughs> like here's Motley Crue, "Too Wild to Tame." Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Look at this. Ooh. At, this, at this time when Kiss was huge on the front cover. What do you got in here? You got a Megaforce ad, and you got Ride Lightning and Kill 'Em All. This is all Metallica was. I mean, this is really all they got. I have another one where they have a half page, and it's like some months later. Yeah. But Metallica had not hit the big time. Yeah. Yet, you know, Ex which is Ex funny because Exciter got as much press. As yeah, they're they're on here with Anthrax and Manowar and all these other groups on there. But uh, which is funny because Ride Lightning. Ooh, Never even heard of Ride that. Ride Lightning is absolutely amazing lone rager lone rager <laughs> yeah well i wonder why you haven't heard of it because yeah. the band name was kind do you know of, how excited they lone are rager, now it was to written, know they were on that page it's a fake Metallica. band and that was came up yeah, by some yeah exactly <laughs> but it's just interesting what was going the timeline what was going on but it's it's interesting how their 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 tones were changing and stuff but some stuff that was already happening was coming up like metallica it was about ready to come up you know but uh, still regardless Animalize is still pretty heavy and pretty rocking. You know? Yeah. And I want to say one more thing about the video here before we move on. The the Paul guitar solo. Because all of a sudden Paul oh. gets a guitar solo. Yeah. You know, and he does his tap thing. Yeah. At the time, I kind of that I kind of liked it. Kind of had a cool little mood. But his whole point with it was, yeah, I can kind of do this stuff. But and then he's like, no. And then he's like, does some some Pete Townsend going yeah. on, you know? Yeah, yeah. And he rocks some riffs down. And I thought that was pretty cool. He's basically saying. I'm the, I'm the riff guy, though, and I'm proud yeah. of it, so. I thought that was pretty cool at the time when I watched it. Oh, I, yeah, yeah, I mean. It was pretty, pretty I, I, You know what I remember watch. is learning that little finger tap thing. Yeah. Goes, da, da, yeah. Da, and I remember thinking, I'm so cool, I can do that, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point you brought up, though, that Bruce doesn't have a solo. Yeah. Like, yeah, no solo. Yeah. Um, Imagine a Kiss show with no lead guitar solo. Yeah. Like, in 77, that would have been unheard of. And it's interesting that the bass solo is so musical. It's oh, a little very, song that he's got put together. And I, if I, I could be wrong here, but I think he that was exclusive to this tour. Yeah. I don't think he went further with that. Mm -hmm. um, he might have, but yeah, it's very cool bass solo. I, and then they go right into I Love It Loud, I think. Probably. Because that's, that's the tempo. 
Um, I think one of these lists. Uh, no, I don't know what it doesn't say. The drum solo is really cool too. Yeah. 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 Eric is on fire on there. Yeah. I mean, it was really good. It's really apparent that Bruce just fit really well. So. Oh yeah, bass solo. I live alone. <laughs> yeah. I always thought it's not my favorite song, but I, the version of "I Still Love You" on this is really good. It's really good. Yeah. It's kind of. Um, it's kind of what you call a show killer, like because it's so down tempo and stuff, it, you know. It's so moody this version. Yeah. Oh, it's great when yeah. you when, when you're going to play for an hour and a half or whatever, you can yeah. slip in something like that, you know. Yeah. Definitely. It's the kind of song where if they were doing an hour set somewhere, of course, at this point they were doing hour sets, but in the other bands I played in, you know, we cut out the ballad or whatever. You know, it's the first thing you cut out because it's going to kill the tempo, of the, you know, the pace of the night. You know? Oh, definitely. Um, some other stuff I got. I got. I had this little. Sticker. Oh, this is Rock Stickers, Winterland Productions. Winterland Productions. Mm -hmm. um, the funny thing is, it's it's uh, San Francisco is where this is printed. Uh, with Marcy and John, this little sticker. Yeah. So, I got this yeah. at a drugstore um, that just had stickers and paper stationery and stuff and odds and ends in North Tacoma. And they had Judas Priest ones. Um, it's a Judas Priest one where they're all standing there, Defenders of the Faith. You know, and they're all in their black studs, and it was that sticker, Scorpions, and one other group. And, um, you know, I, as like a kid, I stuck it somewhere, and I hadn't seen it, but I saw somebody had this on eBay. Um, and I got this from England. Isn't that interesting? And, you know, it's from, printed over, right over here. I mean, uh, Tennessee Street, San Francisco, actually. So it's funny, it's from here. I bought it from someone in England to get it back. <laughs> kind of kind of ironic. Yeah, and it's a, if you can't see, it's a picture from the Heavens and Fire video shoot. Yeah. With Mark St. John. And so these these magazines here, the, the reason why I wanted to mark some of these, oh, that's a great Alex 84, that's prime time. Um, some of the stuff I wanted to, and I marked a couple things, was because, I lost my bookmarks here, because the look, you know, the sound of the album, the energy of the album, the heaviness, the consistency of it, but also um, look the look they had at the time. Look at the jeans back. He's got the axe bass, but he's got, he's all black leather and spikes. Oh, yeah. And the yeah. very next tour was lots of oh. pink and purple oh. and <laughs> flo Sequins flo foofy and... hair. He's got the chain on yeah. his neck. Yeah. He's got spikes on his wrist. Uh, as an 11 year old kid, I thought this was so badass. You know what I mean? This was like, this is right there with like the look of Shadow of the Devil and stuff for me, you know. Oh, yeah. Um, and and I, I love that stuff. And so that's why I put these out because I think they had the right, my point is for heavy metal kids, they had the right look at the time. So and I think it's known now that it's a little bit of a misstep going so frou frou, so glammy on the asylum. Mm -hmm. Tour because the album, but even rocks. even like crew changed their image at that time. Like a lot they of did, did like, and I have some pictures of my me in my room at the time with a absolute pink centerfold of Vince Neil. I blame Bon and, Jovi. <laughs> I blame Bon Jovi, <laughs> but like you know, just it was going on. Their look was good at the time. And there's Mark, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. from the video, but pretty posed that picture. But <laughs> yeah, but their look was great at the time. You yeah, know, let's look it up. Right now. Yeah, this one's from looking up here, but their look was really doing it for who they were, who they were uh, putting these albums out for at the time. You know, I think I think the look was a big part of as a kid, kind of what sucked me in. You know, what I mean? this is where the Gene and Paul interviews were just so kind of funny to read sometimes. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. They would Gene's always talking about the number of girls, or they're asking about the number of girls, and um, Paul saying some kind of like self-help stuff and you know what I mean it was a change in this era where I don't know it's just I remember at the time in Middle Edge and even a few years later some of the interviews were just outright funny oh yeah you know definitely I mean? time. this is one more mag that I have here that has and this is a mag that came out right around 86 or so I think but it's really cool and it's got a lot of um, it's got a lot of animalized pictures in it actually the front is all animalized shots, yeah. you know what I mean? So even though they were, this was like post asylum, it, there's really no asylum. Here's another picture. It's pretty, it's with, pretty random, this book. <laughs> with the BC Rich, but I always love it because it's got that glossy front and it's got some really cool picks. Like here's the pick with the spider. It's got the pick with the spider, yeah. but it's got some really weird stuff in it like this. 
definitely had that on my That's wall. reverse though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Paul Star. Yeah, totally, totally. And then it's got some mix of stuff, but then this is another great one here. That's a good See, one. when this came out, I was just seeing all these things for the first time. I remember seeing that stuff where they did those uh, those things for TV where they played with the blue background, you know, but they had Ace, a little yeah. kind of a little promo tour they yeah. did with them yeah. before you was totally out. Yeah. And so I remember seeing that for the first time and trying to figure out what is that from? Well, here's a picture yeah. from like Alive. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Dicey. So, you know, I, I love this, but it had, it had quite a bit of Animalize in it. That's a really cool Paul shot. And through Animalize, that was his main axe, I guess. And he had the, uh, the broken, you know, the broken mirror one also a bit, but, but uh, kind of cool. There's a look it up, there's a look it up gene. And then there's more Animalize. So yeah. they were just loving Animalize. Well, let's look at their discography. <laughs> I guess it's what they had. Is, was Animalize the last album out? Because here's their discography. No, this, that's crazy. Man. See? Like, yeah, it was like 87. Yeah. Okay. But it's crazy. They're they're actually obviously it's the availability of those yeah, so photos. <laughs> some photographers, but I got a bunch of animalized pictures if you want. Had a lot of animalized stuff. So here's some animalized cassettes. Um, this is how I remember it. Brilliant. With you know the, the tan, tan, the tan color here, and uh, this is kind of a. I have a few other copies up there. There's a ton of lick it up, animalized asylum and crazy nights cassettes in the world. Mega, you know, if you want to find a lot of 80s Kiss cassettes, it's it's pretty doable, you know. Was it always a big deal to you, especially when you bought a cassette, to have the lyrics in it? Like, I would <laughs> no, always... because in the cassette it was so small. I, well, yeah, well now there's no way I could read those lyrics. Yeah, yeah. But um, at the time I was like, I had, if lyrics were in there, I was very happy. <laughs> and I got a, a few more things on the show real quick. Just some collectible buttons. And these again, I got these from some guy in England. Definitely not got some guy sitting at home with his button machine. You got a Mark St. John button. That's pretty cool, huh? Yeah. Yeah. It's one of it favorite, looks like he's borrowing Gene's headband. <laughs> <laughs> and then... Uh, well, maybe it's his whole hairpiece then. Got the animalize in there. You got the Gene of the axe base. That's pretty cool. But I kind of love the um, animalized stuff because it's... Uh, That's that photo, right? Yep. It was what was out at the time. And so it's nostalgic to me, but also their look is pretty rocking. You know, um, if you're still watching, by the way, thank you. If you're still watching, you're you're crazy. <laughs> Maybe you should take a break so they can go get a monster so they can yeah. make it through the rest. Oh, of they it. can pause it. <laughs> they know what to do. Yeah. Okay, let's let's go track by track. Yeah. Um, and you know, you know, we'll. So I had enough. What do you think? I've had enough. What do you think of the Vertigo version of my head? <laughs> <laughs> I've had enough. What is do you think? a great album opener. Mm -hmm. um, it's um, again, it's Paul singing for "Stand Up for Yourself" and you know all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, it's it's heavy as hell. Probably my favorite Mark guitar solo. Sixteenth notes, he's rocking on guitar. All he's missing is that James Hetfield tone, but he's like, you know what I mean? He's like, that is a thrash riff, basically. They had to know that they had a great album album opener right there. Paul plays bass on it. Gene was probably already gone. Uh, maybe he just they just wasn't satisfied. Whatever. Do better. Yeah. So yeah. I don't even think Gene was there at all. I think they just pasted. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so uh, yeah. So I've had enough. Yeah. No yeah. complaints from me. Um, I've heard some people say it's their favorite song on the album. Not mine personally, but I mean, he started the album with it for a reason. That yeah. is a straight up rocker mm -hmm. powerhouse song. You know, and his vocals. For me, I've had enough. Paul's vocals. Just about as high as I probably ever really need to hear him. You know what I mean? He went higher he, on like on some nights, other songs. Nights, yeah. Um, and even on this album, he yeah, went a little get all higher. You can take. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that too. Yeah. Yeah. You gonna do? You know, there's in time. But like some of those, when you're pushing that high, if you don't have that kind of, you know, you're getting a, little, it gets a little pitchy. You know, and you can't quite control it. He does pretty darn good. And I think on Get All You Can Take, he's doing pretty good considering it's a really energetic song. And uh, I never really noticed any pitchiness before. Just until this week, I listened to it with headphones and I was like, oh, you know. But when you're just rocking out listening to it, I think basically Paul's vocals are always stellar, you know. Oh, yeah, without a yeah. doubt. Without yeah. a doubt. Uh, Heaven's on Fire is the second track and of course the first single. First time I heard that, about a month before the album came out, I heard it on... I think it was like a little, little college radio station, like probably Green River or something. Yeah. And uh, I remember, it. to me, it was the greatest thing I've ever heard in my life. It's like, 
because it was good and catchy. Now it is a good song. It's very major -y, but it's heavy. It is a good song, yeah. but it's wore off on me a little bit. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's simple, just like Lick It Up was. Yeah, they knew that we need another, I mean, Lick It Up did it. We need something else that's yeah. simple and universal like that. And, and when I say simple, it is simple. Anybody? Yeah, da, t, 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 t. Yep. Guess what? Da. <laughs> yeah, but it's great. You know, yeah. it's a great tune. Yeah. Um, he sings very catchy so chorus. good on it. Yeah, it's co-written with Desmond Child, and yeah. apparently, Bon Jovi were so impressed with the song that they they said we got to get this Desmond Child guy. Supposedly, Paul hooked him up. Yeah. So you give love a bad name, living on a prayer. Um, <coughs> whether you like it or not. It kind of made Bon Jovi's career right there. So yeah. Paul was responsible, so blame him. Paul did it. Yeah. Blame him. <laughs> Award him, right? <laughs> um, so Heaven's oh. on Fire. I love the video, by the way. The mm -hmm. video was so, uh, they were having a good time. It's a fun video. It it's is. just, you know, chicks and wigs, you know, and <laughs> chicks and wigs and, and guitars. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that pretty much sums it up. <laughs> and a rare appearance. It's Mark, Mark St. John. John. It's a yeah. Mark St. John video, yeah. so it's kind of cool. Yeah, and I always thought, he'd, like, you know, before I knew he left the band, and I'd watch that video, I'd think, he's so badass, I'm glad they got this guy. Yeah, I was already a fan, and then I was spending the night at a friend's house, and uh, I remember I, I was just addicted to the Bark of the Moon at the time. Um, he had Bark of the Moon on cassette over there. I was playing it over and over and over, and we went into this this room uh, where the TV was, had some snacks, put on MTV, boom, it came on, you know. And uh, Evans on Fire, it was just such a good energy. It felt good. I didn't have MTV at the time. He did. So I was pretty lucky to even see it. But I thought it was cool, you know. Oh, definitely. As a 11 year old kid. Oh. <laughs> yeah. was, you were the demographic. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. So here it is the, the controversial song Burn, bitch, burn. I. Oh, my God. Love there's a the curse word. Oh, well, there's another one coming out. <laughs> yeah. Um, burn, bitch, burn. I love. Mm -hmm. um, it gets a lot of flack because of that one line in the song. We're not even going to highlight that line right now. We're, who cares? There's a line in the song that's pretty juvenile. But this is the 80s. Oh, 69? No, that's coming up too. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. You know the one. Probably. I don't know what I was thinking. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, it's cut Gene some slack. The song is great. The riff, oh, man, I love that riff. Um, I think the lyrics so, are actually good. Yeah, there's that. Gene's riffs are playful and groovy. Even mm -hmm. in his riffs, there he has a sense of humor sometimes. You know. Exactly. So uh, the chorus is great with Paul really uh, uh, coming alive there. Mm -hmm. It's catchy. Not like in a like this should have been a single way, but mm -hmm. it's a catchy song. They tried it to, to do it live. Same with I've had enough. They played that live too. Um, so yeah, I Bird Bitch Burns my favorite song. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's oh, really, that's cool. Um, but Burn, Bitch, Burn, and I'm noticing a fire theme going on here. There's, I've had it up into the fire, Burn, Bitch, Burn, and fireplaces. Mm. What's going on here? Fire, maybe that's fire why, in that photo? Maybe that's why Kiss has fire behind every single photo that's come out in the last <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Definitely a theme. <laughs> Don't know what to do with it, put fire behind it. Yeah. You know. The hottest band in the land. <laughs> hottest band in the land. <laughs> so but Burn, up. Bitch, Burn, that is a fun tune. I have oh. to be careful when the kids are around. Because, you know, I'm not going to let this chorus chant around my 10-year-old yeah. uh, daughter yeah. all, all day long. Well, then time. you have to not play the next song as well because the chorus is, uh, what fucking difference does it make? Yeah, but, you know, I didn't even notice. It. Like, it's it's not he, yeah, blatant. It's, it's kind of hidden back there, but, but that is what they say. But calling someone a bitch and saying the F word, mm. yeah, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, and I noticed, um, I could be wrong, but I don't even think it's in the icon the lyric sheet. It just says, uh, what difference does it oh, make? Yeah. But it's obvious what they say. Plus, if I skipped, you know, if I skipped Burn, Bitch, Burn, my daughter would probably say, turn that fucking song back on, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or Get All You Can Take. What happened to track three? Track uh, three? Get All You Can Take is, from what I've read, is Paul's favorite song on the album <clears> um, <throat> because of its Zeppelin vibe. And he's got Paul Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we get what he's talking about, and we love this song. I believe it was in both of our top 20s. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, I love that tune. Such a well written tune. He does sing in a very high register. Um, but uh, of course, great, great, great guitar solo, and I love the Paul's riffing before the solo as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, so far they're knocking it out of the park on this. And so that brings up another song that's kind of controversial, meaning some people hate it. 
like loathe it. Some people, well, at least these two guys love it. <laughs> Lonely. And I'm, I'm going to go so far as to say it's my second favorite song on the album. Um, it's got a good groove. Mm -hmm. The best guitar solo on the album. Thank you, Bruce Kulick, who stepped in and played that. Because I get apparently Mark. I mean, it, it's more of a soulful solo. There's no, you know... Fight, yeah, they were fight. already flirting with, yeah, working with, uh, you know, uh, you know, Bruce. It was just a matter of time. Yeah, yeah, it was just a matter of time. He was, uh, as as Paul said to Bruce in the studio, this is well known, but he said, uh, you know, that was good. Don't cut your hair. Meaning, we're yeah. going to need you at some point. Sure enough, they did. Don't cut your hair. Yeah. Joanne oh, Duran Duran. <laughs> so, and I think he had to shave his mustache off as well. That wouldn't have looked. That wasn't the image they were going for. But he gladly mm -hmm. did, and we're glad he did. Uh, but yeah, Lonely is a Hunter. It's got a good groove. I think it has great lyrics. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a catchy chorus. I think it's the best guitar solo in the album. Gene's lyrics are always cool and ridiculous. And you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. they, they're humorous. And yeah. uh, they're just, just taking ridiculous metaphors and sticking them together in some mm -hmm. kind of... <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love it. You know what I mean? It's got... Some bars of set and eight in there. Oh yeah. Which da, 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 if you're da, da, trying to, da, da, da. you know, if you're a beginning drummer and you put it on the practice with it, uh, there's beats dropping. So every eighth beat drops. Um, there's also some, you know, really cool things about the arrangement where after it drops, it drops that beat, goes through it twice, and then there's a tick and uh, there's some hits. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool arrangements, man. Um, so that takes us through side one. If you're playing the, the record album, you flip it over, and then you got. Under the Gun, starting off side two. Mm -hmm. What do you think about Under the Gun? Uh, so, you know, Under the Gun has got a little bit of double bass. Um, I mean, Under the Gun is kind of like, I always had to try to figure out, do I like I Had Enough More or Under the Gun? They're, they're sister songs in the album, obviously. They, yeah. start, they, they start each side off with a ton of energy. Yeah, I would go for I've Had Enough in that uh, war. But Under the Gun made the live set. They even Heck kept yeah. it around for the next tour, Asylum Tour. Yeah, it's, it's a great tune, man. Yeah. Great solo, great solo. I think Mark St. John's solos on your I didn't even really realize it totally. I knew they were great solos, but I really think he does some interesting stuff. If you really listen to his solos carefully, you can hear that they're kind of pieced together like Vinny's were. Like, they would just catch a bit of fire, like, oh, like, you could just tell, like, that was so fucking good that we're just gonna cut you in right for that. And like, you try to take it from there. There's a couple solos on here where you can tell it's pieced together in three or four. Mm -hmm. And it's because each part was so special and just had character and just had a fire, you know. I think it's because he's flying by the seat of his pants, you know. And uh, they were capturing this really cool stuff at the time. So, uh, the man, his solo is really written. Yeah, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. no, it's written by Paul. Eric and Desmond Child. Not a very Desmond Child-esque song, um, but that's who wrote it. And yeah. uh, uh, it's very fast tempo. They did it live on the tour. Even the, the following tour it lasted for a while. Um, I mean, it's one of the heaviest Kiss songs. Oh, definitely. Not heavy in a Carnival of Souls, like tuned down, ch ch chuggy way. No, but like thrashy. Yeah, almost. it's yeah. very thrashy. I mean... A lot of times Paul's writing these things where he's he's going up and down, you know, the pentatonic or, or he's doing pull-offs off the A or like, what is the earlier song on the where he's doing off the D string? Like, um, he's doing these things like, you know, he's doing these pull-offs where he's on A, he'll hit, hit, hit uh, he'll, he'll do pull-off of E, D, you know, C, B, right down uh, in the minor scale. But if he threw a, a flat in there somewhere, it'd be like, ooh, this is Slayer. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> That's the only thing missing is that dark note in there. Mm -hmm. uh, other than that, it's pretty heavy. And the whole song is really, it's probably the most 16th notes in any Kiss song. The whole <laughs> song is digga 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 digga. I mean, all of it really. And um, it's rocking. I bet Eric loved it. He did actually. There's some double bass in there, of course. Plus, he all kept co writing. So. And he gets to sing in it or yeah. yell or scream. The production. Um, on this is not extremely different from like Ride Lightning. Like, there's no clicky bass drums really going on yet. Uh, the bass drums don't have as much high end, and the bass drums, I'm not gonna say they're buried, but they're in there, you know? So, like, you have to really listen. Like, is it double bass or is it just the guitars and there's a little kick pattern going on? But 
there is still a bass from from moments off and on in this album, but they're kind of mixed in there. Say like, you know, you heard the double bass on Injustice Raw, you know, but on here, it's wait, there's bass on that album? Double bass. <laughs> I know. Ah, I'm kidding. Kick drums. But uh, it's interesting because there is some double bass going on this album for sure, but it's not like in your face kind of double bass, you know. But this is a song where you're hearing that on there, and, and um, also, you know, the opener on track one. But the solo, um, which we just listened to for a second, for me, that solo is just shredding my face off. My face is still melted. I, I wasn't going to say anything. Does it look like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a, it, his, his, Mark J. John's playing was absolutely amazing, you know what I mean? He was just. That his you can hear his control, you know, like he they probably could just ask him to do anything and he could do it. You know? And from what I understand, he was being asked to do a lot of things because he had to be coached a lot, I guess. Like play it more like this or whatever. So. The solo kind of starts with what sounds like a like a pinch harmonic dive, you know. Yeah. Such a thrash thing to do. It is a good solo. Maybe even before it was a thrash thing to do all the time, you know, but Yeah, so uh one of uh, the highlights of Mark's tenure in the band, I would say. And then we got Eric. You said it's Eric singing fire. And Eric is the one screaming fire. Yeah, you know, if you're a metal band at 84 yeah. or 5, you're yelling fire. <laughs> you're, you're yelling die. You're yelling <laughs> something like that. Fireplace. Yeah. Things like that. <laughs> logs. Yeah, yeah, you're talking about logs or something. Yeah. But something badass. Again, fire. Know. The theme is back. The theme is... It's, yeah. It's it, man. It never went away. The, the album is on fire. You know? <laughs> I mean, it's just, yeah. Um, so speaking of um, the album being on fire, they mm -hmm. they put out the fire for the next song. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know so, where to go with that. Um, so you're not a big, you're not a big fan of Thrills. I, I, it is one of my least favorite Kiss songs. I um, think it's great. Uh, I think it's just a really really well written song where the verse kind of settles down. Doom boom boom boom, and Paul's got his husky. I'm a sexy singer. Oh, yeah. do, 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 do. He's pulling that voice out from like uh, it's not you belong to you me. You almost sounded something. like Michael McDonald there for a second. Well, it's kind of it's the same guy. You didn't know that? <laughs> Blue eyed soul. Yeah, there. it's like that game show host that yeah. was in you know spy. So. <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, super bright snare drum on the intro because I think that snare of the intro was overdubbed. And so that's why it kind of has a different sound, you know. But there's that was probably Schwarzenberg. That probably was. There we go. We solved it. See, it's that bright snare sound that's on yeah. the Gene album. It's like it's the okay, same. Exactly. Shape. Yeah. But um, yeah, there's not a lot of snare in the song if you listen to it. It's kind of interesting, um, and uh, it's just got a cool mood. The toms and the bell and the ride on the chorus. It has a cool mood, and uh, I think it's a great tune. And I, I sing it as a twisted tune around the house. I'll get addicted to singing that chorus for like just months where I'm just annoying myself. I'll just like, you know, the girls are probably saying, what is this? Du, 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 du. I'm just making up the <laughs> stupidest twisted tunes. See, the people not from Seattle don't know what a twisted tune is. A twisted tune? Yeah. Well, you know, you got to sing the most, um, yeah. you know, the grossest lyrics, usually about poop or something, <laughs> that, go, that go with your, yeah. your classic hits. It was a know? big thing in, on Seattle radio. <laughs> This one radio station would do that. Twisted Tunes. Everyone knows about okay. Twisted Tunes, okay. right? right. Yeah. Maybe. You know. But wrong lyrics. Yeah. <laughs> Spontaneously. <laughs> yeah. Being dumb, basically. So that's a really fun one for Twisted Tunes. Yeah. I, I don't know why, but it's just so dramatic. Um, and, you know, and something makes her tingle is the, yeah. is the line. Um, but hey, man. Paul they said it. They it for a second it. single. I accept it, man. Well, I... I, I any song with the word tingle in it, I just, I'm all about it. Yeah, so so Peter actually said <laughs> something to me early on, like maybe yeah. during our first episode. He said, even the Bad Kiss songs, I can find something that I like. And so I, I do like the riffs in the verse. Dun, dun, um, digga, 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 and, yeah, but in the last verse, when it kind of stutters a little bit, uh -huh. that's cool. Yeah. They change it up. So I do like that. So yeah, any Kiss song I don't really think is all that great. I can find something I like. Yeah. Usually it's a vocal or something, but in this I love that guitar ripping. Yeah. Um, they chose it as a single. They actually did it live on this. I forgot about that. They did it live. Uh, it didn't last, I don't think, throughout the whole tour. I mm -hmm. could be wrong, but um, <clears throat> yeah, it it's not the worst song ever, but it's definitely not one of my favorites and definitely my least favorite on this album. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So that leads us into. While the city sleeps. While the city sleeps, yeah. yeah. I just love the way Gene sings, man. Uh, part of it's just that I just love it. 
Yeah, another Gene song that supposedly sucks. Yeah. No, it doesn't. It's There's nothing wrong with While the City Sleeps. It's the balance of the two songwriters. You know, it's that whole take on uh, that aggressive, on top of the beat kind of thing Paul does. His riffs are kind of busier. Um, the Gene is like a little more plotty. He's got that groove. He's got that... Do -do -do -do. You know what I mean? That, I Love It Loud, to me, is quintessential Gene. Yeah, like you can tell Paul would listen to more like of the raspberries and things like that, and Gene was more into Mountain and King Current Crimson and things like that. Like yeah. their influences come out. Gene is more plotty and riffy and darker and heavier. Mm. Really. So yeah. while the city sleeps, uh, although it's out of the four Gene songs in the album, it's my least favorite one. I still love it. Um, mm -hmm. I could see that song being on Dynasty. Really? Yeah, I can. Yeah. Well, lyrically. Yeah. And yeah. song title wise, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, or Unmasked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, it's uh, a good song. Um, I'm glad to get to it because I usually, it's, you know, falls thrills in the night. Mm -hmm. I usually skip right to it, really. I think it's, I just think it's a great riff. Da -na 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 -na. I think it's got, dun -dun -dun. pretty sure that's a chromatic. Dun -dun -dun -dun. It could be minor, but it's got that thing that just walks up and down. Dun -dun 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 -dun. As you know, as a connector before it goes right into the verse, mm -hmm. um, I love it. And uh, even my notes here, I said I want to mention when he says "Give him hell." I love it when he says it. Oh yeah, give him hell. You know, I just oh, yeah. love it when he's uh -huh. just giving it with his voice. So. Uh -huh. Definitely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Great song. Um, anything else you want to say? But I see you got some. <laughs> nah, I mean I said it. Okay, All I right. said what I wanted to say. Okay, and that leads <laughs> us into. And by the way, that was uh, co-written with Mitch yeah. Weissman of Beatlemania, as is the next song. <laughs> A Gene Mitch Weissman song, Murder and I Heels. And another song that certain people do not like. Um, I, don't <laughs> get, I don't get it. It's That mm -hmm. riff is great. Yeah. That, that, yeah, it's... Uh, I, okay, it's not the catchiest song in the world. He pretty much speaks the chorus. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what he's writing about isn't exactly, you know, much different than any other song he writes. Um, maybe it's not the best album closer. I don't know. I, I like it though. I think it's. Good. I think it is. It's this kind of thing where, like, I'll look it up too. Where probably Paul, who is the producer, um, is like, well, we'll just put those two songs at the end. We'll put those Gene songs. Oh, because you know, eighth, eighth day, and you know, Gene's got a couple songs at the end of the. Uh, look it up yeah. album too, where it's like, oh. where's Paul's? Paul's thinking, where should we put these? Let's put them at the end. Yeah. But Murder and Hail, I, I, I love it. I think it's fun. I think it's. It is actually a good song in the album. Yeah. It has that riffing yeah. going on at the end, and it kind of takes the song out. Um, yeah, I, I love it. Um, there was a time it was my favorite song on the album. Um, and I know, Shane, I know you love it. Um, but Burn Bitch Burn is my favorite. What is your favorite song on Animal Wise? I, I just, I'm not good at those. I. I I have a hard time doing that. I would say for a Paul song, I would say probably Get All You Can Take. I'd go it's with just that. A, such a well-rounded, well-written song with a good feel. I would agree. But then again, if I wanted to rock, I, I, I'd had enough. I, I mean, I don't know, you know. Um, for, for, for a Gene song, because I'd have to divide it, I think While, While the City Sleeps, for me, is probably... Okay. Um, it's, it's got a mood to it. Uh, I just yeah, it's it's. I just think it's. I think it's a. I'm gonna say this. I think it's a really, really well written song. I guess that's funny to say about Gene Songs from the '80s because he just doesn't get props. But well, certain people just would not agree with. I that. don't get it. What's <laughs> the guys that are like, yeah, I'm this band Kiss. I've been a fan forever. And what's his Gene? What's his name again? I'm gonna read it off a cue card. You know, I mean, yeah. Maybe they just don't really listen to the music much. I really don't know. No. But again, who has to like these songs just because I think they're good? But but I just wanted to say online that I think they are. Yeah, the Gene songs. <laughs> that The whole purpose of the show yeah. was to defend the Gene songs and Gene in general. Um, okay, so he did some movies. I don't think Runaway was too time-consuming. Yeah. I think he probably went to Canada for a couple weeks. <laughs> and Gene's paying us for this, too. Gene's in here cooking tacos for us. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, yeah, uh, there was nothing wrong with Gene's output in the 80s. Um, there just wasn't, okay? I mean, how come every album Gene's songs are my favorite ones? You know I mean? I, <laughs> yeah. like, His voice, probably, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, really quick, favorite song on Asylum? Probably any way you slice it. Yeah, yeah. Or, yeah, exactly, so...
But it, it took Paul to have those songs that were loud and proud, forceful mm -hmm. with the big chorus. Mm -hmm. You had to have both. You no, know? it's the dynamic that yeah. is going on. Yeah. You know, yin and yang. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of like him and I during Drills of the Night. He loves it, I hate it, but we can find some common <laughs> ground. Yep, yep. Yeah. And um, I've poisoned his drink. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, for me, uh, they were just on this momentum. They were climbing up. And this is probably the biggest album from the 80s, right? I mean, it's the biggest album from the I, 80s. I think it was their biggest selling album. I mean, at that point, an Asylum came along. They just had a little more trouble on tour in comparison. Um, and again, they just didn't have that big, hit, that big hit single on Asylum. Asylum is just as good. but They, they, had, they had an MTV hit. Tears of Fallen, but... Yeah, not like Heaven's on Fire. Yeah, no, no, it wasn't Heaven's on like Fire is an anthem, yeah. you know, oh, yeah. that they still play now. I mean, yeah, yeah. Well, I guess they do Tears of Fallen sometimes. Once in a while. But, um, but the look, I'm going to say that I think Gene looked badass in that wig. <laughs> it was a wig. <laughs> yeah. But when I was 11, I didn't really think about it. I just thought, mm -hmm. this hair looks pretty rocking though. It looks oh, yeah, pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. You know, yeah. he doesn't look like Gino Valley anymore. <laughs> or, you know what I mean? Like, I thought... I thought that it was really cool. The studs came back out. Yep. The axe base fit in. Mm -hmm. It was... <laughs> They'd go in a different direction yeah. on the following album, but for then, yeah, Gene looked very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Paul always wore the brighter colors, you know. And yeah, they were in all the magazines. Yeah. Um, when I went to the fair, uh, the Pialic Fair we have here, now it's the Washington State Fair, I would like to, I went to all the rock stands and try to find Kiss stuff. Oh, ooh, is that an animalized Kiss bandana over there? You know, <laughs> all this stuff, the buttons, the shirts. The I mirrors, was the mirrors with the logo. I mean, Kiss was just one of the like um, half a dozen or maybe 10 bands that were just really huge at the time. You know, the Quiet Riot and Juice Priest, Scorpions, all those groups. Oh, yeah. um, mm -hmm. For me, it was a special thing because this, they had this whole history, you know, um, it's kind of like, wow, there, there's, those Clark Kent's are up there. We know that they're really Superman, but those are, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was just special, you know, and I was learning about the makeup years too. Every magazine that came out, I mean, every 84, 85, 86, a lot of Kiss specials were coming out, you know, it would have the discography and I'd be like, Ooh, and I'd be studying oh, yeah. the order and trying to figure out. Why, ooh, Vinnie Poncia, ooh, he did those two albums in a row. Like, you know, you just figured, oh, yeah, yeah. You figured I was you piecing study, all this You study it all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was a really, really fun time for me, 84, 85, 86, getting into stuff. And... Very special time. Yeah. Yeah, because you, I'm a little older than you, but I was like in my mid-teens, and yeah. this stuff was really hitting me. Yeah. And I look at it now, and it's still quality stuff. There's a lot of nostalgia that goes into it, too. It's not There yourself. is. But like I mentioned um, earlier, um, like three hours ago, I think, some more time. <laughs> Something like that. Um, I took big long breaks from Kiss in general, and got and got way into my drumming and way into like Elvin Jones and all sorts of stuff. And um, I would come back to it, and it would sound a little different, but the quality was always there, and the, I knew the songwriting was always there. Sometimes I was kind of removed, and I'm thinking, wow, those aren't McCoy Tyner chords. Those. <laughs> You know, I had to get back into it, and it took a little time. But I remember in the car, driving around in the north end of Tacoma here, listening to Animal Eyes and going, God, song after song, is super solid, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of quality in this album. Yeah. Um, I don't know how you felt at the time. Well, you were just getting into Kiss, but a lot of vindication came with this album. Because all of a sudden, Kiss was popular again. Mm -hmm. And it felt good because, of, you know... Oh, really? Yeah. Me and Shane and some people, we loved Kiss through the lean years, you mm -hmm. know. And for me, I just arrived at it and I just took it for what it was. My friend gave me a copy of Alive and on side two was Alive 2. And that was a, that was a, quite a bundle right there that I just listened to every day trying to absorb it all and get to know it all. And then I figured out Analyze was out and that was the next one I bought. And I'm going to say that I thought it was just as good. It was just a different thing. Of course, I had Quiet Right at the time. I think I might have already had Out of the Cellar. So I was ready for some... Four on the floor, <laughs> heavy metal. You know what I mean. Yeah. I was I was primed for it, but I didn't I didn't think necessarily Alive was better than this. It's just a different thing, you know. No, oh, totally different. So. Totally different. You're like, oh yeah, totally different. <laughs> <laughs> but all good quality stuff. Yeah. Okay, so this has been our album review of not just Animalize, but of Animalize Live Uncensored, the whole era for the band. Um, 1984, Kiss, Animalize. Woo! Thanks for watching. If you stayed this long, 
We could not appreciate it more. Like, subscribe, leave a comment. And what do you want to do next? Oh, he's putting me on the spot. You asked me last time what do you want to do next. What, what do you want to do? Do we want to stay in the 80s? Are we just... Do we want to tweak out on the 80s more? Or do we want to go makeup? I don't even know if I can go back. I don't even know if I like makeup after this episode. You know what I mean? <laughs> I don't even know. Um, it's, good. it's not what the people want to hear. But let's, <laughs> let's decide. Mad at me right let's now. decide off camera. because it's. Or do you want something off the top mm. of your I do know that before this, we talked about a live too. I'm ready for a live too, but I could also do a silent now because this leads right into it. So maybe one of those two. Okay. It's going to be a live too horror Yeah, style. it's a big mystery for those 11 people yeah. who like this podcast. Who are, who this Basically, if it's a live too, I won. If it's a silent, <laughs> he won. So yeah. maybe we'll compromise and do Peter Solo. <laughs> I'll do it. No. Absolutely. I got a lot to say about that. You want to just do that? <laughs> um, do Peter Solo? We better talk about it. Right okay. <laughs> Sorry, Peter. But I guess we should do one people are going to watch, I suppose. <laughs> so we're... Okay. I love the Peter Solo, but you know. So. Well, we have to do it eventually, though. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for watching. Yeah. We're going to get this straight, what we're going to do next, you know. And... Till next time. All right.